Joan Adler, we welcome you to our men's group today. Uh, we have a lot to learn about the Strauss family and uh, about all your other endeavors and accomplishments. Uh, I think we're in for quite a treat this morning. Joan comes very highly recommended for one of our past speakers, so, and he was excellent. It was Jim Mackin who talked about the 39 World's Fair, and that's how we made the connection. So, Joan Adler, without any further ado. Thank you so much. It's great to see such a great turnout. I'm delighted that you all came. I wanted to thank George for inviting me today. Uh, I'm delighted to speak to all of you. As you know, my name is Joan Adler, and I am the Executive Director of the Strauss Historical Society. The Strauss family I'm going to talk about today is the family that owned Macy's for over 100 years, and also Abraham and Strauss, also L. Strauss and Sons. It's the family of Isidore and Ida Strauss who went down together on Titanic. Most people know that story. It is not the family of Levi Strauss, of Jean's fame. It's a, that's an entirely different family. Strauss is a little bit like Smith. You know, there's a lot of them around, and they're not all related. But oh, many of them are. This is a rather large family. George asked me to give you an overview of this family history. I've been their historian for 25 years. And so I keep you here. Is it better? A little over. Okay, I was afraid people wouldn't be able to hear me. Uh, I could keep you here for months, probably, telling you stories about the family. They are an amazing family. And I'm going to just try and pick out the most interesting and important parts so that you won't fall asleep. I know there'll be one or two sleepers, always happens, and that's okay, I'm used to it. Before I begin, I'd like to introduce you to Catherine Smith. She's all the way in the back videotaping this presentation, and she's the assistant director of our historical society. And she's really the person who makes me look good. She's responsible for updating our website, our Facebook page. She helps with all sorts of media, flyers, things like that. And she's got lots of other things to do. And it's only a small portion of what she does. She's very, very busy, and she's terrific. OK, so here we go. Let's see if we can do this. The Strausses originated in the southwestern part of Germany, in the Rhine Falls area. It's the part of the world that was sometimes France and sometimes Germany, depending on the political situation. And so the family, besides speaking Hebrew, also spoke French and German. They were educated people, men of culture and education, and they were landowners. They sent their crops, mainly wheat, oats, and clover seed, and those of their neighbors to markets nearby. After the revolution of 1848, many people felt a financial pinch. Lazarus Strauss, who had become the head of his family when his father died in 1838, participated in the revolution, but only by raising money. He didn't fight, he didn't do anything else. But he learned that he was going to be called before the courts. At the time, there was also very, very poor financial situation. He was the oldest of 14. And in order to raise money for some of his siblings, he sold off some of the land that the family owned. But because there was such a financial crunch, some of the people who bought this land reneged on it. And so in order to maintain what his family did own, he declared bankruptcy. They sealed up the house, and he left. He was concerned about having to discuss with the courts his role in the revolution. He traveled to Philadelphia in 1852 the center of German-Jewish immigration of the time. And he was advised that there would be greater opportunities for him in the South. Now, he was born in 1809, so in 1852, he was a mature man, having to start all over again. And remember, this was a man who spoke French and German and Hebrew, but no English. So this was pretty brave. He traveled to western Georgia to start a new life at age 43. He was an observant Jew, and he had no friends in the rural South. But he met up with the Kaufman brothers, who were from Lichtenau. Lichtenau is about 80 miles, 80 kilometers, excuse me, north of Ottoburg, where he came from. And they had already had emigrated in 1851 and set up a little dry goods firm. That's the, in the South, they call them juice stores. And they supplied him with a pushcart. 
Now this is very different. We all from New York area think of push carts as a Lower East Side existence. But in the South, being a push cart peddler is a pretty good thing. They didn't have cities and towns the same way that we did, dense population centers. People were living on plantations. And the plantations were pretty far from one another. And so the push cart peddler had a horse and a cart and goods that he obtained mostly from Philadelphia, but some from New York. And he would drive from plantation to plantation and deliver goods that people ordered. He would also bring news from one plantation to the other. And he was so revered, in fact, that most of these plantation homes, even the ones that exist today, had an outside porch with a room and a separate entrance. So if he arrived at night, he could let himself in, sleep there, put his horse in the barn, feed the horse, and in the morning he would have breakfast with the family, bring the news, usually little trinkets, separate little gifts that he would bring for the wife and the daughters take another order for the next time he came to visit, and then move on to the next plantation. So he did pretty well. He was a smart man. He learned English pretty quickly, obviously, because he did pretty well. At one point, he was in Talbot County, in a little town called Talbot, which was the county seat. Once a month, they had court day, where the grand jury would hear all the court cases that had accumulated. And this had become almost like a festival or a fair day. So. Uh, farmers would bring their merchandise to the center of town. If they slaughtered a pig, they would sell the meat. If they had vegetables, they would try to sell that. And so when he came, he, he commented that this was the first civilized place that he had seen in this rural south. And he decided that maybe this was a place where he could live with his family. He had left a wife and four children back in Germany. He took a, a store. It actually was half of a store, at least half of a store, from a barber named Captain Curley. And he opened a dry goods store. Now, I think most of you will know, in that day, you couldn't buy ready-made clothing. So dry goods usually meant linens, towels, bolts of fabric where people could, women could <coughs> sew dresses and other things that the family needed. Lazarus sent for his family. His wife was Sarah, his first cousin was very common in those days. And the four children, Isidore, Hermione, Nathan, and Oscar, they arrived in New York September 1854 on the maiden voyage of a mail ship, SS St. Louis. And this is an image of that ship. Now what's interesting to me about it is that this was the maiden voyage of that ship. And we all know that later Isidore perished, coming back, trying to come back from Europe to New York on the maiden voyage of another ship. If any of you do genealogy, is something else that's interesting. This is the manifest. And where the red arrow is, you can see the mother. She's called Marie. They left from La Havre, and we're assuming that the clerk had heard male, meaning mother, and so he wrote Marie. The four children are listed totally wrong ages, totally wrong sex, and in some cases, close but not exact. Isidore is listed as a, as a female. Hermione is Herman. Nathan is Natalie, and Oscar is also listed as a female. So if you're doing genealogy, you really have a problem unless you know something about the family you're working with. I know for sure that this is the manifest, but it's quite a challenge sometimes. What's really amazing is that Sarah, you can see how she's holding her hand like that? She had had a stroke about two years previous to that and was partially paralyzed. And yet she made this journey from Ottawa to La Havre to New York, where Lazarus met the children. They all commented, we have autobiographies from, from several of the children, so we know that they were excited when they saw their father waiting on the dock and they couldn't wait to see him. The family then traveled to Philadelphia because it was a smallpox epidemic in the South and he didn't want to bring them into this. So they stayed in Philadelphia for three weeks. Philadelphia was also a port, so they took a ship from Philadelphia to Savannah. Then they took a train from Savannah west to a little town called Geneva. And from there they took a rockaway, which was a cart with a big carriage with very large wheels, to their new home. It was quite a trip for a woman who was partially paralyzed. And this is a photograph of the first house this family lived in. It's in Talbot, 
And to me, it looks just like a shack, but, ama shack, but amazingly, the children were really thrilled with this house. Oscar, the youngest, later wrote, we found a very comfortable house ready for us. My precocious brother Isidore immediately inspected the hole and thought it odd to be in a house built on stilts, as he called it. The house, typical of that locality, has no cellar, but was supported by an open foundation of wooden pillars about 25 feet apart. And that was for drainage and also for a little bit of air circulation. And here we have the children. This was taken in Talbot in about 1860. So on the far left is Isidore, and then his younger brother, Oscar. And over here is Nathan, who always loved animals. And, and so we have a picture of him with one of his dogs. Now, they lived in, in Talbot until the end of the, uh, until 1863. And we have lots of stories. I'm only going to tell you a few because, again, I don't want you all to fall asleep on me. So the first is that Nathan, even as a young boy, was always a wheeler dealer. And as I've told you, his, his mother had had a stroke and was partially paralyzed. He was looking for a bargain. And he went to the slave market, because remember this was the rural south, and he bought his mother a very pregnant slave. The family loves this story. He thought he was getting two for the price of one. But what he didn't realize was that there was this very pregnant woman who really couldn't do much work, and then there was a baby. And now they had two mouths to feed instead of one. The family's attitude towards slaves was philosophically they did oppose them. But Lazarus, the father, did buy slaves. He taught them to read and write, and he taught them a skill, and then he freed them. And so we hear that slaves from that area begged to be bought by the Strausses. When the family moved north at the end of the Civil War, they brought two young slaves with them because the boys were too young to be freed and left on their own. And I only wish we had records of the names of those two young boys that we could follow and find out what happened to them, but we don't. The oldest son, Isidore, decided he wanted to gain appointment to West Point in New York State. But the beginning of the Civil War ended that. He wrote that by 1861, almost the entire South had become a big military camp, and he wanted to become part of it. So boys from the age of 16 to 18 were organizing into troops and offering their service to the Confederacy. But the governor, Joey Brown, told them that there weren't enough arms for the men, and they certainly weren't going to use them for boys. And so Isidore went to the Georgia Military Academy in Marietta. The other thing I should tell you was that all the schools were closed because all the teachers were now conscripted into the army. So there was nothing for these boys to do. He helped his dad in the store, but he did want to make a contribution. And he felt that at the Marietta Military Academy, he could continue his education and also perhaps join the war effort. But an incident during this visit dissuaded him of that. He arrived a little bit early and was told that his interview wouldn't be for a little while, and that he should go to the dormitories and visit with some of the boys and learn what they thought about this. And he met an acquaintance, somebody he knew. So he, on his way, he went to the dorm and to one of the rooms of the boys, and he didn't notice that the door was just slightly ajar. And when he opened it, a strategically placed bucket of water fell on his head. He didn't think that was very funny. And he said, if this is what the military is all about, I don't want any part of this. And he can only speculate later that this one incident changed the course of his life. Because on the way home, he hired a buggy with a driver in order to visit a mill a few miles away. And he made a contract for delivery of some grain in which he made a good return. Isidro felt this was the beginning of his business career. The Strausses were active in their community. But in September of 1862, a presentment by this grand jury in Talbot County by the order of the governor, accused the Jews of usury. Lazarus, who up until that time considered himself a valuable member of the society, was very hurt by this and decided he would no longer live in this town. And so he moved his whole family 38 miles west to the larger city of Columbus. It took them one day to get from Talbot to Columbus. Could you imagine taking one day to go 38 miles? And everything they owned fit into one carriage. Incredible. Earlier, in April of 1861, President Abraham Lincoln issued a blockade proclamation. Ships interfering with the commerce of the Union would be treated under the laws of piracy. England quickly recognized the state of war between the two factions and declared their neutrality. And this act was seen by the Union as sympathetic to the South. 
From the beginning of the war, leaders of the Confederacy realized they would have to obtain great quantities of military supplies abroad. Remember, the South was mostly rural and agrarian. They didn't have much of a manufacturing base. And they found themselves without the military armaments necessary to conduct a protracted war with the Union forces. The South didn't have a merchant fleet large enough to bring these supplies from Great Britain, Nassau, Bermuda, or Havana. In order to remedy this, companies were formed, like the Georgia Importing and Exporting Company. A newspaper article from June of 1863 announced its formation, quote, for the purpose of opening and carrying on direct trade with foreign countries, unquote. Lazarus was one of the subscribers. Each subscriber pledged a specific amount of, of currency, usually in bales of cotton, and expected to receive profits in direct proportion to the amount of his subscription. On September 19, 1863, Isidore wrote to his uncle Emmanuel, this was Lazarus's brother, who had by now settled in San Francisco because of the gold rush. Quote, the war in which the South has been engaged within the last three years has called upon the requisition from time to time all the resources within her command. The company was made up in our city for the purpose of purchasing ships, wherein to run cotton out and merchandise into our country. An agent was appointed to go to Europe and try to negotiate a loan with the cotton aside security. This agent appointed me his assistant with the understanding that I would to pay my own way. And if he succeeded in negotiating, then I would to purchase the merchandise wherein the ships were to be loaded. Father was very anxious for me to accept this position, as it was one of the few chances which men offered for which I could so honorably bid farewell to our once happy, but now almost miserable country." Unquote. Isidore was taken on by the Georgia Importing and Exporting Company as the secretary of Lloyd G. Bowers. He traveled to Charleston, where in his first letter home on June 18, 1863, he wrote, arrived here safe and dirty. We met here with Charlie Lamar, a celebrated African trader, who was going with us. He's a very fine man. Mr. Bowers is a perfect gentleman. By African trader, of course, he meant slave trader, when describing Charlie Lamar. But this was 1863 in the South, and being a slave trader was considered a fine profession. Isidore found passage on the Alice, which left that night. He wrote home from Nassau, Succeeded in running by 17 ironclads and monitors without even being discovered, much less fired upon. Theirs was the only ship that successfully ran the blockade on June 18. We haven't been able to find an image of the Alice, but this is an image of a ship very similar from the same time period. He wore an undershirt-like garment in which his mother had sewn $1,200 in gold. He was required to lie below the waterline of the Alice until the ship was safely out of Charleston Harbor and he described his appearance upon being allowed on deck as that of a man who had been in the Russian baths. Isidore arrived in Nassau, New Providence on Sunday the 21st, and after a stopover in New York, arrived in London on July 24th, which is pretty much more than a month of travel for him. When Isidore left Charleston, he had a letter of introduction to Frank Rothschild's wife, Amanda, to her father, Nathan Blunt, who was living in New York. And at the time, Isidore had no way of knowing if he was going to New York. But the letter was welcome. Then it was dangerous for Southerners to be in New York. But he thought, well, it couldn't hurt. I think I'll take this with me. And as it turns out, he did stop in New York on his way to Europe. And he did receive the hospitality of Nathan Blunt. And this is important because, although he didn't mention it in his letters from the period, Nathan Blunt had more than one daughter. Amanda's sister was Rosalie Ida Blunt, who in 1871 became Mrs. Isidore Strauss. When Isidore stopped there in 1863, Ida, as she was known, was only 14 years old, and probably too young to hold much interest for him. They were reunited in 1871, where she was a tw lovely 22-year-old, who quickly captured not only his interest, but his heart. They became an eight, engaged in April, and married July 12th. They didn't believe in long engagements in those days at the home of her father. Isidore spent the war years in Europe trading in Confederate bonds. The city of Columbus was occupied on April 16, 1865, actually after the war was over. Unfortunately, General Wilson had received word, and he burned it. 
This is the only known picture of Columbus taken that day. Lazarus was left with almost nothing. He had enough. He decided to start over at age 57 in the north. The family traveled first to Philadelphia, a trip of eight days, and then to New York on Isidore's suggestion. Letters from Lazarus to his family in Germany describe the robberies, fires, and killings. He wrote in September of 1865 that he had been out of business since April and that he would feel calmer and more satisfied once he had a going business again. Isidore hoped they would go into the import business together. Lazarus used the time until he could figure out what to do next by visiting the suppliers that he had and paying off his antebellum debts. The only money he had was from selling off at a considerable uh, loss the cotton he'd stored during the war. He stated that even if he left his children nothing at all, he wanted to leave them a good name. A Mr. Caldwell was so impressed with Lazarus' integrity, this was the first money he had received from all of his southern accounts, that he offered to sell Lazarus his business, stating that Lazarus would not get rich from it, but that it could make a good living. He bought that business for $6,000, and in the first year made $60,000. Remember, that's 1865, 1866 money. That's pretty incredible. The lease was signed in May 1866, and L. Strauss and Son was formed. It was Lazarus and Isidore, partners. They were importers in China, crockery, glassware, and manufacturers of lamps. Nathan joined the family business after completing high school in New York, and then it became L. Strauss and Sons. And this man, Lazarus Collins, is the husband of the daughter of Hermione. He stayed at El Strauss and Sons his entire career. Here we have a picture of Hermione. One of the things the family did was cut glass. Uh, in those days, there was no way to, to put etch, or they didn't etch their names of the company. So the only way you could tell that this was an El Strauss and Sons piece of cut glass was by the pattern. And so these patterns were patented. When they were sold, there was a little paper label effects. But these things were actually used, not like today where people just stick them on a shelf for display. And so as soon as something got washed, the paper label was gone. And so we have these catalogs with patterns that had been patented. And that's how we were able to identify which pieces of cut glass are L. Strauss and Sons cut glass, and which pieces, which the name. So this one is Hermione, named for the daughter. Isidore, as we know, spread the war years, learning how to do business. And he returned with $12,000 in gold that he'd earned in the two years that he spent in Europe. He was 18 when he left and a man when he returned. The money was used to buy his mother a house and contribute to the new business. We know they prospered. Isidore describes in his autobiography the frugality that made that possible. Nathan became friendly with a man named Roland Hussey Macy. Yes, there was a real Macy. The owner of a dry goods store. In 1874, the Strausses opened a 25 by 100 foot concession in the basement of Macy's. At that time, the center of commerce was on 14th Street and 6th Avenue. And they were going to sell their L. Strauss and merchandise in the dry goods store in the basement. In the first year alone, it accounted for 60% of the store sales. And for the first time, dry goods and home furnishings were sold under one roof. And on this distinction, they have always said that that was the very first department store. So there are people who argue that, but the Strausses have always said that. Roland Hussey Macy died in 1877 on a business trip to Paris. Coincidentally, he was traveling with Nathan Strauss, who had become his very good friend. Macy's heirs were unable to take over the running of the store. He had a son and a daughter, and in those days, the daughter wouldn't inherit the father's business, and the son was a drunk and a ne'er-do-well. But he did have several cousins who tried. Some of them died. Each, you know, each year there'd be somebody new who would give it a shot, and they didn't do very well. And so by 1888, the Strausses became partners in the store, and by 1894, they were the sole owners of R.H. Macy's. They continued to expand L. Strauss and & Sons, and in 1893, they also became partners in a store called Abraham & Wexler, renamed Abraham & Strauss. Some of you will know that, the Brooklyn Department Store. It was, it was opened in Brooklyn because this man, General, his name was General Abraham Abraham. And he had this vision. It was when the Brooklyn Bridge was being built. And since the center of commerce in Manhattan was on the lower uh, Manhattan, he felt that once the Brooklyn Bridge was open, people would come across to Brooklyn. And so he, he had the vision 
to store his store there, and then the Strausses bought into that. Sarah Strauss, the mother, died in 1876. Actually, she died after an appendectomy. Lazarus died in 1898. Now remember, he was born in 1809, so he was quite an advanced age for people at that time. After Sarah's death, Sarah lived with his daughter Hermione and her family. And although there was a gradual change in leadership, Lazarus did remain active and interested and involved in the family business, while his older sons, Isidore and Nathan, took on a more prominent role. Isidore stayed in the store attending to business, while brother Nathan, who had way too much energy to be confined to an office, traveled the country opening up markets and to Europe on buying trips. And as their sons completed college, they also started working in the store. Before 92, it became clear that the 14th Street store was no longer big enough, and there was no more room to expand on either 14th Street or 6th Avenue. What would happen is they had this one store, and then when they needed more room, they would just knock out a hole in the wall and go next door. And then they would go in that way and then they go in that direction. And so they had this rabbit warren of stores, but they finally ran out of stores that they could buy or places where they could expand. Encouraged by Isidore's sons, the Strausses quietly began buying up property on 34th Street and Herald Square. At the time, it was really very far north of commerce, but they had a vision. They knew there was gonna be a, a subway line that was gonna be expanding to 34th Street and also that there was going to be a cross-town bus. And so they felt that people would be able to get to the store. And this was a good time to move. Uh, if you look at the picture up there, this is an illustration of the store, you'll see that there is a little notch in that building. I don't know if any of you have ever noticed it. When the Strausses decided that they wanted to buy up all that property, they did it very, very quietly because they were concerned that the store owners would start jacking up the prices if they knew that the Strausses were going to be buying their property. And so they were able to buy property on the entire block except for that one corner. That's Herald Square. That's the corner of 34th. And there was a tobacconist who had that store at the time. And he refused to sell except for some exorbitant price. And the Strausses said, fine, we won't buy it. And so even today, I think there's a sunglass up there today. At the time, it was a cigar store tobacconist. What they do own, and I'll show you a picture in a moment, they do own the air rights above it, and so there's a giant sign above it, but they still do not own that one little tiny corner. This is, the Strausses opened, in, within Macy's on the eighth floor, they opened an L. Strauss and Sons glass cutting shop, feeling that if people could see the process of the glass being cut, that that would interest them and that they might buy more of their product. Um, if you notice, there were little triangular shaped things hanging above the, the cutting wheels, and that's water dripping down on the wheels because it, there's a lot of sparks that are generated when you cut glass. And what they finally realized after not too long is that it was pretty dangerous cutting in this big building because the, the floors were made of wood, there was a lot of wood around, and they were concerned about fire. They didn't have really great fire departments. Uh, and so they only cut there for a short time. They did have warehouses and other places that where they cut this, and in fact, one in Hoboken did burn to the ground a little bit later. As we, oh, here's the, the air rights, so here's the sign, it's still there today, one very similar, and they do own that. In this picture is quite old, this is from the 80s, but you can see there was a sunglass hut, and I think the sunglass hut is still there. As we know, R.H. Macy prospered. One could hardly travel anywhere in the United States today without finding a branch. The Strausses also bought other department stores, such as LaSalle and Koch in Toledo, Ohio in 23, Davis and Paxton in Atlanta in 25, and Bambergers in New Jersey in 29. And for many years, R.H. Macy & Company has been called the largest department store in the world. Today, there are 800 branches of Macy's around the country. Kat and I have been to Chicago twice on, on speaking tours, and it's the only place where I've been where they really hate Macy's, because Macy's also bought Marshall Field. And they're very, very happy with their Marshall Field, and so they're annoyed that the Strausses bought this store. In any case, in 1986, there was a very bitter leverage buyout. And the Strausses had continued to own Macy's until that time. And they were bought out in 1986. And so there was no more Strauss presence in Macy's. And so that's the part of the story that everyone seems to know. But they tell me, with a roll of the eyes in the head, that we are so much more. And so I'm going to tell you about the so much more. 
This is the youngest brother, Oscar Solomon Strauss, who didn't want to go into the family business. The father and son supported his desire to complete his education, including college and law school at Columbia in New York City. As early as 1865, Lazarus wrote to his family back in Germany, saying, Nathan is valuable to me in business, only he doesn't have much patience to learn. But I want Oscar to go through all the schools, since he enjoys learning. And since we're talking about education, let's just have a little segue. Isidore never completed high school. I don't think he went to any level of high school. Nathan completed high school in New York City once they moved in. And Oscar was the only one who never went into the family business who did go to college and law school. So when you think about what this family accomplished, it's quite extraordinary that these people were able to do so much with so little education. After Oscar graduated from law school, he worked in a law office and then opened his own firm. But he was working so hard that he soon realized he couldn't sustain the effort without injuring his health as he was overworking. And in letters to his brothers, he stated that he has no desire to go into business, which he considered merely money-making. Quote, my whole outlook is idealistic rather than practical. If public service was career, that's what I'd like to do. And then he made it his career. He began writing and publishing articles. And in 1874, he founded the YMHA. And in 1892, he was the founder of the American Jewish Historical Society and its first president. He drew the attention of politicians from both sides of the political aisle and was nominated to represent the United States as minister to Constantinople in 1887. The only way we have an ambassadorial position is if the country, the receiving country, has an ambassador in our country. And so in those days, there wasn't an ambassador to the United States from the Ottoman Empire. And so when they sent a minister, it was a minister rather than an ambassador. Henry Ward Beecher, then one of the most famous clergymen in New York, wrote a letter of recommendation for Oscar to President Grover Cleveland. And I'm going to quote it because I think it's rather important. Of his fitness, there is general consent that he is personally and in attainments eminently excellent. But I am interested in another quality, the fact that he is a Hebrew. The bitter prejudice against Jews, which obtains in many parts of Europe, ought not receive any countenance in America. It is because he's a Jew that I would urge you with this appointment as a fit recognition of this remarkable people who are becoming large contributors to American prosperity and whose intelligence, morality, and large liberality in all public measures for the welfare of society deserve and should receive from the hands of our government some such recognition." Unquote. With his family's support, Oscar accepted the position and served from 89 when Cleveland until 89 when Cleveland was defeated. He served again from 98 to 99 under William McKinley, and he also served as Secretary of Commerce and Labor, that was one department then, under President Theodore Roosevelt, the first Jewish cabinet member, and he served at the pleasure of both Republican and Democrats. He became a permanent member of the Court of Arbitration at The Hague and was instrumental in the formation of the League of Nations. The list of his accomplishments is five single-spaced pages long. He wrote an autobiography under four administrations from Cleveland to Ted in 1922, and he wrote several other books. Truly a remarkable man. After his death in 1926, it was proposed that a statue be built to honor his service. It was to be placed in front of the Commerce Building in Washington, but before it could be built, the Great Depression happened, and then World War II prevented that. During World War II, they weren't using any metals that they could want to spare the metals for that. They needed it to build planes and tanks and whatever. In 1947, President Harry S. Truman finally dedicated a lovely grouping on a proposed federal triangle. Then the Commerce Building was demolished. And in Washington, D.C., there's a statute that says that any group of statuary once dedicated cannot be put in storage. And so for many, many years, this lovely group of statues was in a parking lot. And then in 1998, the Ronald Reagan, I never get this right, Ronald Reagan Federal Building and International Trade Center was completed. And the, the group of statuary was rededicated. So here you have this lovely fountain, and these two black blobs on either side are those statues. And that's the Ronald Reagan Building. I don't know how it happened, but I told the government that they needed to have a rededication, not only of the building, but of the statue. And they said, okay. 
So we went to Washington with family members and we had a wonderful, wonderful day and, and a rededication of this statue. As I've already told you, Nathan had far too much energy to be contained in a classroom or in an office. He was a man with a multitude of ideas, many of them involving how to help his fellow man. Uh, I'm going to take another little aside for a story. When the family was leaving the South, they went on a carriage to Nashville where they caught a train. And when they got to Nashville, Nathan, who was a youngster still, happened to be wearing gray clothing. It was just, that's what he chose to wear that day. And some of the Union soldiers saw him and grabbed him. So when the family left, he wasn't able to get on the train. And he wound up stranded in Nashville. There was a shopkeeper, he realized he was hungry, and there was a shopkeeper who took pity on him and gave him an ice cream cone. He had never had an ice cream cone before, and he was so intrigued with this, he had one quarter in his pocket, and he bought another ice cream cone. And then realized that he didn't have any money to buy any food. But eventually, by the next day, he was able to get passage on a train and go to his family. But this family story is that from that moment on, he decided that if he was ever in a position where he could help people who were hungry, that he would do so. And he did throughout his life. So now back. He anonymously gave out free turkeys at Thanksgiving to all Macy employees. And he continued that until his death. And most people never knew they came from Nathan. He instituted health care in the workplace. It was the first time there was ever a nurse and or a doctor in a store to take care of the employees. They set up a lunchroom where employees could get free coffee and a roll in the morning and very, very low-cast lunch because they found out the employees were saving their money and not eating because they wanted to help their elderly or ailing relatives. They were the first company to set up what today is known as a mutual aid society. They also set up a camp where employees and their families could go to the country for a week. They were just an incredible family. In the 1890s, two of Nathan's children died and he wondered if a cow was infected with tuberculosis, could that disease be carried into the cow's milk? He had previously met Louis Pasteur, who had invented a process of killing germs by heating milk. It wasn't milk in those days. It was by heating something, some liquid or some food, to kill the germs. Louis Pasteur did not think about killing it with milk. That came, idea came from Nathan Strauss. And he hired some, some doctors and professional scientists in New York to figure out the process. And then he built a laboratory with his own money. And for the rest of his life, from 1892 until he died in 1931, he championed the cause of pasteurizing milk. He's the one who brought pasteurization to the world. Incredible. What he said was, I will build a pasteurization laboratory for any municipality anywhere in the world if they will send professionals to learn the process. And that's what he did. And he was passionate about it. We are just in the process, Kat, Kat is publishing a book written in 1917 by his wife, Lena, to describe the process, to describe, it's over 500 pages, and it's, it's really just a love affair with this husband and a way to spread the word, because as late as 1917, they were still getting, fighting to get people to understand and adopt this process. Nathan often vacationed in Lakewood, New Jersey. He was denied admission to the famous Lakewood hotel at one point because he was Jewish. And so he put together a group of investors and he bought the hotel. I love that too. <laughs> After several years, he opened it as something he coined the phrase preventorium. The idea was that if he took healthy children who were living in homes where there was tuberculosis and he brought them to the fresh air, healthy food, exercise, no one had understood really about the immune system, but that's what he was doing. He wanted to build up their immune system so they would not get sick. The people of Lakewood, New Jersey, didn't really understand that these kids weren't sick, and they didn't want them in their presence. And so they were very upset about having these children in Lakewood. He was, Nathan was very good friends with Arthur Bisbane of Hearst Publications, and Arthur Brisbane donated land in central New Jersey, and they moved the preventorium to central New Jersey. In his travels around the world, Nathan and Lena visited Palestine, now Israel, in 1904. And they were so taken with the conditions that they built the Jerusalem Health Center and opened a center where workers could be trained to do meaningful work. He funded soup kitchens, which, continued, which he continued to fund until his death. 
The city of Netanya in Israel is named for Nathan Strauss. They named it for him in the hope that he would donate a lot of money to them. And by then he was an elderly gentleman and he said, I've already donated most of my money. I don't have a lot to give you. So they sent the mayor to his home. At the time he was living in Mamaroneck, New York in a really lovely house. And the mayor was so excited because he was going to be wined and dined by this rich, famous man. And when he came down to breakfast in the morning, he was served cold cornflakes. He was not happy. Nathan wrote, give until it feels good. What you give in health is gold. What you give in sickness is silver. And what you give in death is lead. By the time he died in 1931, he'd given away three quarters of his fortune. His wife sold all her jewelry and gave the money to Hadassah. He is revered around the world for his selfless philanthropy. This is but one memorial. It reads, Pasteur, great master of medicine, Strauss, savior of babies. It was commissioned for competition for a memorial for Nathan Strauss, but it was never erected. But I like it, so I like to show it to you. Now we turn to Isidore. I think he's best known for having died on Titanic, along with his wife of 41 years, Ida. But as the family is wont to say, we are so much more. Isidore was head of R.H. Macy and L. Strauss and Sons. With his brother Nathan, as you've already learned, they built the 34th Street store. With the assistance of Isidore's sons, Isidore was the oldest, and so his sons were the oldest. And in fact, Jesse, his oldest son, and who later became ambassador to France, that's another story. Uh, and Percy went to Europe in the summer before they built this to learn all of the most progressive uh, things that could be done within a department store. And so this, this building is really built with the most modern and progressive of, of things. If you go there today, you can still find some of the original wooden. If you're ever on a wooden escalator, it's from 192. They're trying to get rid of them because they can't find parts to uh, rebuild them but I believe that they're still maintaining one or two just because. Isidore was asked to run for an unexpired seat in the House of Representatives in 1894, and he won that election. And he served as a close friend and advisor to President Grover Cleveland. He was acknowledged as an expert on tariff reform. Like his brother Oscar, he felt that it was his duty to serve when asked. But when his term expired, he requested that his name not be submitted for re-election as his responsibilities at home were great. And I've included this slide simply because I like it so much. This was taken at the Follies Berger in Paris in, 18, in April of 1907. The original photograph contained a note written by Isidore that read, we ate some birds for lunch. Mrs. Strauss, my interpreter, translated them as Latin sparrows. In reality, they were larks. This is the consequence taken at night by electric light. And I like this because most of the photos we have of them are so serious, but this one is a little more frivolous. Isidore never publicized or emphasized his philanthropic endeavors. He did what he thought was right, what must be done, what he was able to do, without the need for notoriety or publicity. I've seen his personal daytimer, with just about every evening filled with some meeting of a committee or a board. He was the founder and the first president of the Educational Alliance, a settlement house tasked with teaching young immigrant families English and skills so they could find employment as well as providing social services and a place for recreation. He served on the board of the Clara de Horch Home for Working Girls, Montefiore Home for Chronic Invalids, which became Montefiore Hospital, a huge institution, only a box from where we are. Oh, well, that's something else. He was interested in Jewish courses, including the Hebrew Orphan Society. But he was also interested in non-sectarian causes, and he served on the board of the New York State Board of Chamber of Commerce and Hanover Bank. And like his brother Oscar, his list of involvements was huge. And here we have a photo of Isidore and Ida's home on West 105th Street between Broadway and West End Avenue. This is a very late photo, so over on the far side you can see an apartment building. They actually owned the whole block. They had stables. And Brother Nathan and Mayor Hugh, New York City Mayor Hugh Grant kept their horses there, which they raced on something that was called the Speedways, now Harlem River Drive. They were vegetable gardens, and they had the first indoor porcelain bathtub. 
which was put on the second floor and it was so heavy that they had to reinforce the floor. So in order to get into that bathroom, you had to step up six inches. And I'm told that at one point there was a flood. They had two inches of water in the house. This is the last known photo we have of Isidore and Ida. It was taken in 1910. In January of 1912, Isidore and Ida left for a prolonged stay in Europe, as was their custom. Their sons were minding the store, and they would visit the spa towns, and also families still in Germany. Their last stop was in Paris for some shopping, and then in London, where they stayed at Claridge's Hotel. And Ida wrote to her children in New York that she could not find matzo at the hotel, even though it was Passover and that she suspected her grandchildren were having an Easter egg hunt on the lawn of the West 105th Street house. Each year around Passover or Easter, and again at the Jewish New Year, I get a lot of mail. There is a story that circulates, people telling me that in 1912, Isidore and his brother Nathan were in Palestine together. And Isidore said, oh, look at that filth, look at that poverty, I don't want to have anything to do with that, and he left. And he went home on the Titanic, and because of his attitude, he died. Whereas Nathan stayed in Palestine, became philanthropic, and was spared. There is no truth to this story. So when you receive it, don't send it to me. <laughs> I have written a rebuttal called Debunking the Story, which is on our website, which you can find, uh, telling what actually happened. Isidore was in Europe for the winter, as was his custom. They did meet in Palestine for a brief time, but only because it was planned that way. And Nathan, who was also in Europe for a brief time in Palestine, really was there because he was going to Rome to, to attend a conference on tuberculosis. And so the, this story really, truly has nothing to do. Isidore was in Europe since January. He was in his 60s, and at the time, people felt that the best doctors were in Germany, and so they would go to these spas for their health, for the cure. But he was ready to go home. It was time. He had visited Germany. He had visited France and England. There was a coal strike in England at the time, and coal was being diverted from all the other ships to Titanic because there was so much publicity about this being the most amazing, remarkable, whatever. And so Titanic was almost the only ship that was leaving. It was time for them to go, and that's why they took Titanic. Isidore and Ida's oldest son, Jesse, and his wife, Irma Nathan Strauss, along with their daughter, Beatrice, decided to sell, sail to Europe just about the time that Isidore and Ida were expected to sail home. They took the ship America. At the time, telegrams, which were called Marconi's, was really just a novelty. And so they were exchanging telegrams back and forth. And so we have one of those telegrams which says, fine voyage. What does it say? Fine, feel, fine ship, feeling fine, what news? Cable became very important shortly after that as a means of communication once Titanic sank. And we have many of those cables where the family and various officials are looking for the Strausses and relaying news back and forth. After spending the winter abroad, Ida hoped to find a new maid in Paris who they could bring to New York. She wound up hiring a maid in England who decided at the very last moment not to go. And so then she hired Ellen Bird, and I'll tell you a little bit about Ellen in a minute. This is the last letter written by Ida Strauss, and as you can see, it was written on Titanic stationery. It was written April 10th. It was mailed in Cherbourg. The ship docked there before heading that they left from Southampton in England. The ship went to Cherbourg where the mail was offloaded. And that's why we are lucky enough to have this. It's written to Mrs. Burbridge, the wife of the manager of Harrods Department Store. And it reads, Dear Mrs. Burbridge, you cannot imagine how pleased I was to find your exquisite basket of flowers in our sitting rooms on the steamer. The roses and carnations are all so beautiful in color and so fresh as, as though they had just been cut. Thank you so much for your sweet attention, which we both appreciate very much. But what a shift! So huge and so magnificently appointed. Our rooms are furnished in the best of taste and most luxuriously, as they really are rooms and not cabins. Besides, seems to bring us troubles. Mr. Strauss, who was on deck when the start was made, said that at one point it looked painfully near to the repetition of the Olympian's experience on her first trip out of the harbor. But the danger was soon averted, 
and we are now well on our course across the channel to Cherbourg. Again, thanking you and Mr. Burbridge for your lovely attention and your wishes. I am with cordial greeting, which Mr. Strauss heartily joins. Very sincerely, I, Ida R. Strauss. The Olympia, she's mentioned, was a sister ship to the Titanic. It and the RMS Hawk collided when it was launched in 1911, so that's what she was referring to as collision. And indeed, when the Titanic was launched, they hadn't accounted for the amount of suction created by these enormous propellers. And so the ship started to sway a little too close, but it was, the captain was able to avert that. I'm sure you all know the story about the sinking of Titanic, and I'm going to just tell you a very small part as it relates to Isidore and Ida. As the ship was sinking, Ida gave her fur coat to her new maid, Ellen Burr, stating she wouldn't be needing it any longer. Ida was encouraged to get into a lifeboat, but she did not do so once she realized that Isidore was not going to get in with her. He was told he could leave the ship, as he was a distinguished older gentleman. But he said there was still women and children aboard. Remember, this was the age of Severly. And he wouldn't go. And once she, she was actually in a, a lifeboat, and when she saw that he was not going to step in as well, she got out. And they were last seen arm in arm on the deck of the ship. And we know that because on the rescue ship Carpathia, there was a grocery buyer from Macy's. And he went around to all of the survivors as they were being brought onto the ship and interviewed them and said, have you seen Mr. and Mrs. Strauss? And once he had a compilation of what he thought was the actual story, he wrote it to the family and told them what had transpired. And so we have first-hand knowledge from this man of what happened on the ship. After Titanic sank, families were asked to send information describing the victims so if their bodies were recovered, they could be accurately identified. And so here we have parts of the description sent for both Isidore and I. Know this. There are second pages for both of those. Isidore's body was recovered, brought to Halifax, and then shipped to New York by train. He was first buried in the Salem Cones Mausoleum at Bethel Cemetery in Brooklyn, but later moved to Strauss Mausoleum here at Woodlawn Cemetery when their sons, Jesse, Percy, and Herbert, and their families were interred. Ida's body was never recovered. This, this little boat-looking thing in the front is supposed to be an Egyptian funeral barge. And Isidore's body, there's a courtyard there, and Isidore's body is buried in the ground, just on the inside of those gates. If you ever go up to Woodlawn in the Bronx, it's an amazing, amazing place. And there is an historian there named Susan Olson who does walking tours that are incredible. So if you have any interest at all in some of the most amazing families, R.H. Macy is buried there, Gimbel's has, Wanamaker's is there, there's lots of people there. They do uh, period tours, they do special topic tours, and it's really very interesting, strangely enough. Almost immediately after the Titanic sank, a committee was formed with the idea of dedicating a memorial to Isidore and Ida. The land on West 106th Street between Broadway and West End Avenue was chosen because it's only one block from where their home was located, and it didn't take long for the memorial to be fully funded. A contest was held to select an architect and a sculptor. Everett Tracy was chosen as the architect, and Augustus Lukeman was a sculptor, and he sculpted memory. That's this beautiful, lovely little lady there. At the time, she was sitting looking over uh, a reflecting pool. The model for this was a woman named Audrey Munson, who posed for this and many, many other statues in New York City, including the statue on top of the municipal building and the one in Columbus Circle. There was a book written about her, which is just fascinating if you're interested in anything that, like that. It's called American Venus. One of the reasons why she was chosen is because she was one of the few women of the day who was willing to pose in the nude. On April 15, 1915, Strauss Park was dedicated by Mayor Mitchell and the people of New York. Today, Strauss Park is a lovely best pocket park stewarded by friends of Strauss Park. There are evening concerts and day-long fairs that are held. Memory peers down on what used to be the reflecting pool, but is now a lovely garden. The, the purpose at the time was stated that she was looking down at the reflecting pool where one could peacefully contemplate over a sheet of water, leaving it to the meditative public to muse over the sacrifice, the same element demanded in the uh, Titanic 
disaster. In 1998, we had a campaign to get New York City to refurbish this park, and we were successful. They added 17 feet on the West End Avenue side, and they put up new gates and benches and railings, and the, the Friends of Strauss Park has a gardener now who takes care of that. Um, what was happening is that this park was so lovely that homeless people were living in it. And they were bathing in the reflecting pool, and they were also urinating in it. And since it's used by them, it's pretty disgusting, since it was being used by the neighborhood children as well, it was decided that if this was made into a lovely flower garden, that that might serve the purpose in a lovely way and sort of eliminate that problem. Isidore began writing his autobiography in 1911 at the request of his sons. But he died before he could complete it. In 1955, his oldest daughter, Sarah, privately published the unfinished autobiography for the family. And in 2011, on its 100th birthday, we republished it. And what we did was we added the rest of the story that he hadn't told. Plus, I write a newsletter for the Strauss family that comes out, actually for the Historical Society, that comes out twice a year. And I write articles of historical nature, as well as information about current things that are happening. There'll be a mention of this at the end of August, the next one comes out. Um, and so we, ad we added all of those articles and we added photographs to the book. And so we brought several copies with us which we would love to sell to you if you have an interest. So as I've come to the end of my talk, I hope you've learned something new about this amazing family. I've spoken about a very, very small part of them. Succeeding generations have carried on the traditions of public service and philanthropy. There really isn't enough time to tell you about them. I write a newsletter, as I said, twice a year, and I encourage you, my business card and Catherine's business card are on the table on the side, and we love communicating with people. If you have any questions, feel free to call or write, email. George will tell you I'm really compulsive and I answer right away, even in the middle of the night. Um, and we love to talk about this family because we, we think they're phenomenal. We brought a few photographs with us, which feel free to pick them up and, and hold them if you want. They're mounted on phone core and they're pretty indestructible. Um, we have thousands of them. So this is just a small sampling. We do have photographs on our website. So if you want to see more pictures of the family, not even then we have not all of them, but we, we have lots. Um, and we'd be happy to answer your questions. We also grow this family tree. This is a project that we're using as a fundraiser, but uh, I wanted to show it because it's quite lovely, and we can show you how to find the various members of the family on that. Whenever I, I do a talk, I like to bring it because it's a focal point. Uh, Catherine is the artist who does these things, and so it's also something for you to think about for your family. We can make one with one generation, or two generations, or three generations, and it's a wonderful gift. We keep it in the computer, so we can update this thing daily. So if you have a new grandchild, or a new son-in-law, or daughter-in-law, they can be added on that day, and one printed instantaneously. So it's a very nice gift, and it's a great project that we've, we've had a lot of, of happiness producing. Um, if you have questions after our, as I said, if, we're going to have a Q&A, but if you have questions and they weren't answered here today, feel free to write to us. We're very approachable. We're very happy to respond. Yeah? Uh, when, I was when I was preparing the publicity for your talk for the magazine that goes to our community, uh, I came across on the website uh, the, the fact that your interest in the Strauss family was stoked by the search you had to make for the family papers that were missing after the store was sold. Could you get a little bit into that? Uh, that seemed like a fascinating story. Sure. Did you all hear the question or something? Okay. Um, it, it's really very strange how this all came about. Uh, my training is in special education, and I was a special education teacher for many years. And then when I had children, I know, I can't figure it out either. When I had children, I was lucky enough to be able to stay home with them, which was just a great gift. But when they got to be about junior high school age, I was starting to worry that my brain was going to die. I didn't want to go, I, I, I'm sure you can tell I'm a little compulsive, and I don't know how to do anything just a little bit. Uh, but I, So I didn't want to go back to work, but I wanted to do something. And this was in the early 1980s, before there was internet. And so I invented a job. I decided that I would do literary research, whatever that means. 
I put an ad in the New York Times in the book review saying that I would do research and people would call me up and say, can you find out information about something? And if it was something that was interesting, I would say sure and I'd read a bunch of books, which was fascinating. People ask questions about things you didn't even know there was a question about that thing. And so I learned all sorts of good stuff and I'd write a little report and I didn't have to work after school and I didn't have to work on school holidays or in the summer. And so it was perfect. And in 1990, this man named Bob Strauss, who lived in Santa Barbara, called me up and he said, my family owned Macy's for 100 years and in 1986 there had been a very bitter leverage buyout. And I have been hiring people for four years to try and get our family papers out of Macy's. He said they were stored there just because it was a big place. Everyone would send the papers to the store. And on a handshake, we would promise these papers. But we had no contract and things were so bitter that the people who bought Macy's were reneging on this property. So here I am, four years later, I said to him, I have no clue if I can do this, but if you will put me in touch with somebody within Macy's who is still loyal to the family, I'll go visit them or call them and we'll talk and we'll see. And here I am, 25 years later. What happened was they were able to sneak me into Macy's. I promised that I, I mean, I just made this up totally. I have no idea what I was talking about, but I said, I will bring a portable photocopy machine. I didn't know there was no such thing in those days. <laughs> they snuck me into the room where the papers were. The man who had the key would give me a little box of papers and I'd photocopy them, and then he would sneak me out at night because I wasn't allowed to have these things. And this went on for months and months and months, and all I had to promise was that I would not leave that room. I couldn't go to the bathroom, I couldn't eat, I couldn't go out, no one had to know I was there. But after about eight or nine months, he trusted me enough to give me the key. And I copied everything. And then I convinced them that while they couldn't, they, they absolutely refused to release this stuff to the family, I convinced them that they didn't own it and that they should give it to the New York Public Library where there already was a fledgling Strauss family papers collection. And so that's what happened. We went together through all the papers and selected, and there were about 25 boxes that were removed from Macy's and given to the public library. But I had copies of all of this stuff by now. And so I started organizing them and looking to see, because no one had a clue what was in there. I mean, we had stuff from 1908 written by Napoleon. I mean, it was just an incredible resource. We had all of these business papers when the family was buying and selling land, and it was all written in old German, so we had to have that translated. We had the Isidore, when he was in Europe during the Civil War, would write six or seven letters a day to his parents and send them by all different routes because he didn't know which one would get through. And so we had all of those letters. And even though I don't have the originals, I had copies. So I started transcribing them. And then in 1993, Bob Strauss came to New York. He knew about seven or eight cousins. And we met at the apartment of one of them because he wanted to describe what had been going on. And I had been, as I said, translating, organizing, documenting all of this material. And we decided at that time that maybe I would start writing a newsletter to let the family know what we were doing. But we didn't really know too many people in the family, and so I got all of those people to give me their address books. And I made a little circular little form, and I sent it to all the people in their address books, and I said, who's your father, who's your mother, who's your sister, who's your brother? And so we started compiling a database with addresses. And it's just ballooned from there. In 1990, oh, well, so then Bob, when he hired me, was already well into his 80s. And he was concerned that when he died, the project would die with him. I, by then, had been doing oral histories and had been meeting other family members. And he asked if I could find some family members who might be interested in funding this. And I said, well, what about we'll just make a group with people from the, ver from the four branches, Isidore, Hermione, Hermione, Nathan, and Oscar branch of the family. And so that's what we did. We got representatives from each family to form a group, and we started soliciting in the newsletter for donations just to help fund the newsletter and my work. And in 1998, we became a 501c3 not-for-profit, and we're still going strong, still here, and still having fun. It's a fantastic job, an incredibly wonderful family. Lazarus Department Store, which was the local department store in Cincinnati. I know that was the seat of uh, Federated Stores, which ANS was part of. Does Lazarus named after? No relation? Just coincidence. 
Secondly, uh, I didn't get the age of Isidore during the Civil War, but the Confederacy resorted to conscription during, in 1862. Was he of military age or was he subject to, he went off to Germany, as you said, but was he subject to conscription during the war? Isidore was born in 1845. So when the war started, he was not old enough to join. But as I said, he and a group of young boys did try and form a company and were just told there weren't enough uniforms and arms for the men. And they certainly weren't going to arm the boys. So he went to England. What the, what the plan was, they were going to they were going to run the blockade, sell the cotton, buy arms and uniforms, and also build uh, blockade running ships because they didn't have enough ships. And indeed, only one ship was, was built because by the time he went, it was summer of 1863, and the war was not going well, and so they decided maybe they should wait and see what was happening because all of the blockade running ports were being bombed and closed. And so uh, they only built one ship, which was really used very, very gently. But he was just too young. Yeah. The uh, cut glass that they made, no, no one have ideas of it, it must be valuable now. And what is it called or where is it? She's asking about the cut glass. Um, it is quite valuable these days. You can find it on eBay. Their, their company was called Els Strauss and Sons. And the only way to be identified, as I said, is by the pattern. But people who, people who collect this kind of stuff know about it and can identify. We have pattern books, and so we can tell the patterns, whether it's an L. Strauss and Sons. One interesting thing is that they were so good at this, the tariffs were very, very high. And so Baccarat sent the blanks across to L. Strauss and Sons, and they cut Baccarat glass here. So a lot of the, the L. Strauss and Sons glass is Baccarat. Somebody many, many years ago decided that L. Strauss and Sons was Lewis. Strauss. And so if you ever see Louis Strauss and Sons, it's actually L. Strauss and Sons. It's a mistake. It's the same company. And, and there, are, there are collectors who know about this. There's a, a, uh, an association called the American Brilliant Cut Glass Association, and they have conferences, conventions every year. And so there are collectors of these kinds of things. Um, it's different than pressed glass. And a lot of people have glass that they think is cut glass, but it's actually pressed glass. One of the ways you can tell is if you feel the edges and they're rounded, soft edges on the top where all the, those little pointy cuts are, that's pressed glass. But the actual cut glass, the edges are very, very sharp. It's incredible when you think about it. This stuff was all done by hand. And it's, it's so precise. It's so amazing. Okay. Any more questions? Yes. There was not, because the family was so upset at this bitter leverage buyout that people who still own stock or were in it were out of it by 92. What happened was, it was not bought out by Federated. It was bought out by a group of members of the board of directors who slowly bought up the stock of other people until they had a majority. But, and so the last few, there were only a few remaining family members in it by 1986. But they left at that point, and all of the family sold this stock because they were just so upset with the way this was handled. And then Federated bought the stock, bought Macy's from this group of board of directors. But it was the board of directors, starting with Ed Finkelstein, who really ran it to the ground. When he bought it, the economy was great on a high, and he thought that he could live the high life. So he was flying on private jets, you know, crystal glasses, and if I kuna throws on his lap, and spending an awful lot of money, and not really minding the store, and realizing that the economy shortly after that was taking a downturn. And so he, he really wasn't as skilled as he thought he was. And so after things became a little tough, that's when they sold to Federated and had a problem. But by then, the Strausses were out of the store. Well, thank you. This is